Yes, first, I would like to thank um, uh, the organizers for inviting me and also for very, uh, very, very uh, nice lunch today with plenty of wine, which undoubtedly should improve quality of presentations today. Um, my talk today is a little bit strange, but uh, the good news are that I didn't have any problems in publishing it. If I try to publish something similar, say, 10 years ago, I would expect a lot of objections. Um, the reasons are that, say, 10 years ago, if uh, something published in one of the, say, nature journals which would indicate some microscopic quantum retrocausality, uh, at the end, there would be a legal disclaimer which would say, uh, this work must not be considered as evidence for causality violation. That's, that, that's a must. Uh, these kind of disclaimers, they disappeared now. So there is not a problem discussing causality in one way or the other. Um, so we're approaching uh, technological evolution. There will be big changes, and I expect paradigm changes in science. And one of the areas in which we expect these big changes probably would be our understanding of time. So let us try to discuss what this understanding of time is and what uh, different concepts of time. Um, first, of course, what we all like is the river of time, as a flow of time. Uh, poetic words, they very well aligned with our intuition. But in fact, of course, we understand that time cannot flow. It cannot change because uh, there is no any other variable to, so that time can change with respect to. What happens is that some sequence of events, and this sequence, which is shown here, changes in time. So it's a, it's a change of events in time which we perceive as a flow of time, as a river of time. And again, uh, each of these events is probably causes the next one to appear. So now we speak about causality, and what causality is, is a big question. First, of course, we've got a very good understanding, intuitive understanding, what this causality might be. So if we have this vase, falling down and then it's broken, the A, uh, A is a consequence, A is a cause and B is a consequence, obviously. That's what we intuitively understand. We also can conclude that these two events, A and B, they're connected to each other. But why A is a cause and B is a, is a consequence? And philosophists, they try to define what is cause, what is consequence for a very long time. And they could not, to such a simple and intuitively understood uh, relationship between these events, they could not give relatively strict and clear and simple definition. There are hundreds of papers published on this. Now, <clears throat> the one conclusion which we can draw is that Okay, A precedes B, so by definition, A is a cause and B is a consequence. But then we come to a circular argument. We define time, error of time, direction of time, in terms of cause and consequences, and we define cause and consequence in terms of the direction of time. So we need to break this loop somehow. Um, if we want to break something, we should go to some ideas which were expressed a long time ago. And these ideas were first expressed by Boltzmann. As they were repeated many times over and over again, but perhaps the idea in form which was expressed by Ludwig Boltzmann was the deepest. He identifies he identifies the direction of time with the second law of thermodynamics. All, all laws, all physical laws, we know, they're time symmetric. 
mechanics is time symmetric, relativity is time symmetric, general theory of relativity is time symmetric, quantum mechanics is time symmetric, relativistic quantum mechanics is time symmetric. There is only one, one law that we know which is time asymmetric. That's a second law of thermodynamics. Uh, <coughs> his statement is very deep. It's not just identifying the time as we perceive it with the direction of the second law. He's saying that the time as we perceive it is the direction of increase of entropy. And he goes as far to say, if it was some part of the universe in which entropy would be decreasing, then people living there would perceive our past as a future and our future as the past. Okay, so how this, how, why, what, how time works. First, uh, if we deal with, say, a mechanical system of large dimension, then uh, according to conventional laws, what we have, we have Hamiltonian systems, the volume would not increase. And uh, generally, if we start from some initial conditions and go forward in time or backward in time, we will have something like a sponge. That's what I brought as illustration, as a prop from Australia. So the volume of material can be quite small, but sponge can occupy much larger volume. So <clears throat> uh, in this case, the phase volume remains constant, strict phase volume, and entropy, which is logarithm of this phase volume, roughly speaking, uh, does not increase or decrease. It stays constant, forward in time and backward in time. Now, what is time? Time is a little violation, tiny violation. It's so small we cannot measure it directly. We don't know what it is. It's a time primer. It's a process, a known process, which violates these idealistic, idealistic properties of conventional mechanics. And it makes a small deviation from these laws which allow for increase of the volume forward in time and decrease of the volume backwards in time. It violates, it violates symmetry of, of time. And it creates direction. It, it wasn't suggested by me. It's suggested by many other people, and Pinrose would be one of this. And uh, they have all different explanation what it is. Uh, I don't believe in the explanation. I, I simply think that the law is not known. Why, why we have, um, what process is actually responsible for direction of time? What physical process? All right, <clears throat> now we need to go down to quantum mechanical level. At quantum mechanical level, we have unitary evolutions. And these unitary evolutions are time symmetric. They can go forwards and backwards. And they don't increase or decrease entropy. It's analog of classical mechanics. But then there are some other processes. And these other processes are usually associated with decoherence. And decoherence, when we convert a pure state into mixed state. And then, if you start from a pure state, then uh, unitary evolution would convert it into another pure state, no entropy change. But de decoherence would make it a mixed state. And now you know, don't know in which state you are. You can be in any of these states. In ideal mixture, this would be with equal probability. Entropy increases. There is uncertainty now. Information is destroyed. Again, what's the physical mechanism behind this decoherence? It can be discussed, there are different theories, but what's important for us, there is decoherence. It's present, it acts, it changes the world forward in time. Now, what it means for us, we remember the past, but we don't remember the future, why? We look at a photograph and we see an image. This image tells us about the past but, past, but it does not tell us anything about the future. And let us see an example, which is, I think it's a very good example. You see footsteps in a sand. 
these footsteps tell you about somebody walked on, on the sand, or somebody will work, walk, walk on the sand. Of course, it tells you about the past, but why? So if somebody walked, then footsteps appear, but they would be washed away slowly. Entropy increases, information is cleared, and if you see, and if you see footsteps somewhere here, you always assume somebody walked. Let us try to assume somebody will work on the sand in the future. So he will work. Again, both lines are in accordance of conservation of energy. They don't violate any energy relationships. But here, instead of disappearing, it would appear from nowhere. And this line does contradict, does contradict to the law, to the second law of thermodynamics. It's impossible. That's why intuitively we always assume that's what happened. Somebody walked on the sand. And these footsteps can be seen here and then disappear. Nothing like this can appear without a cause. That's what we perceive. The second law of thermodynamics we perceive as causality. Causality helps us to understand this action of the second law of thermodynamics intuitively. Anyway, uh, <coughs> also initial and final conditions. You can set, for small intervals, you can set probably initial conditions as well as final conditions. Uh, but generally, you are much better off setting initial conditions than the final conditions. Because when these footsteps disappear, it's very difficult to solve a uh, problem backwards in time. This problem would be ill-posed. So <clears throat> also, you start from this condition or that condition, and you finish up with equilibrium. Information is cleared. It's very difficult to go backwards in time if you're going to set the final conditions. So that's, again, it's a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics, but it gives us a very simple, very simple rule how we should apply. We should use initial conditions, not final conditions. And that's nothing else but the principle of causality. We should start from initial conditions and we should proceed forward in time. That's the safest way of obtaining um, obtain correct solutions. Now, <clears throat> matter and antimatter. Uh, what we know about particles and antiparticles. Um, according to quantum mechanics, antiparticles are particles moving backwards in time. Uh, there is, in the microscopic world, in quantum world, uh, it's CPT symmetric, so when you switch from particles to antiparticles, you need to reverse the direction of time, and then you get exactly the same solutions. And this universe is full of matter and radiation. It has particles and antiparticles, but there is no antimatter present at all. No one has ever seen it, and we are very lucky, because can you imagine what would happen if a little stone made of antimatter would just fall somewhere nearby? There would be a very large explosion. But no one, no one has ever seen any substantial quantities of antimatter. So what I'm saying is that we know properties of matter, and thermodynamic properties are associated with macroscopic objects. And we know these properties quite well. But we don't know anything about properties of antimatter, because it doesn't exist. No one has ever seen it. We know about my microscopic properties in quantum mechanics, and we know particles and antiparticles. We know that this microscopic world is CPT symmetric and is not CP symmetric, but we don't know much about what these antimatter properties would be. And if we can see the macroscopic properties, thermodynamic properties, they don't exist for elementary particles, but they exist for macroscopic objects. There are two possibilities. One possibility is conventional thermodynamics, which is varied for matter, can be extended into antimatter in two different possible ways. The time, thermodynamic time, can run for antimatter either forward in the same direction as it runs for the matter or backward. 
in opposite direction. This gives, gives two fundamental possibilities. How thermodynamics, how conventional thermodynamics that we know can be extended from matter into antimatter. It's either symmetric or anti-symmetric case. In some way, matter and antimatter are equivalent, but we don't know which of these cases. They're mutually exclusive. They cannot be valid at the same time. But at least one of them is correct, and the other one is not. OK, what it means for reaction mechanisms. Say we have reactants. We have two molecules. One has some energy, another one does not. They react and they exchange energy. Excited A at the beginning, and non-excited A and excited B at the end. The reaction rate, as we know, is proportional, is proportional to concentrations of reactants, but not concentrations of the products. And it's strange why we put reactants in, but never put the products. An explanation, of course, is this process of decoherence. Because before every reaction, um, these particles go through running time represented by decoherence. And decoherence actually distributes these particles equilibrium uh, equivalently between all possible phase states. Now, the probability, the probability of finding two particles in the same box determines the reaction rate, determines the reaction rate. So <clears throat> the simple rule that we take decoherent, decoherent components, which are in conventional thermodynamics value of components before the reaction, and product, product of uh, number of particles would determine the reaction rate. Now, what would happen if one goes forward in time, one decoheres and another one decoheres? Then concentrations which would determine the reaction rate would be A star and B star, decohered components. As you see, expression would be different. Now, what it means for us in terms of energy exchange between matter and antimatter? What it means for us if we can see the conversion of matter, and we allow for conversion of matter into antimatter, and, and vice versa? Uh, I would just go to, the, to conclusion. So in case of symmetric thermodynamics, matter and antimatter are equivalent. Thermodynamics would predict equal quantities of matter and antimatter present. In case of antisymmetric thermodynamics, it would favor full conversion of antimatter forward in time into matter, and it would favor any conversion of energy from antimatter to matter. In very simple terms, according to anti-symmetric thermodynamics, antimatter is extremely hot. It's hotter than sun, it's hotter than any other object you can imagine. It would just, any, any heat associated with, any thermal energy associated with antimatter should be transferred to matter forward in time. Now, uh, how this agrees with equivalence of matter and antimatter? And if you look, then this transition occurs forward in time as we go. We are matter observers. But if we imagine ourselves as antimatter observers, backward in time, the same amount of energy and the same amount of mass would be, would be transiting from matter into antimatter. So antimatter and matter are still equivalent in some way. Now, let's forget about matter and antimatter because no one has ever seen antimatter, although they're, they're actually trying to make it. And there are some attempts to create antimatter atoms. And it's not very far from here 
when sooner or later some quantities of antimatter will be created. And then we'll see what kind of thermodynamic properties they have. Are they the same or different from properties, from, from properties of matter? But uh, let us discuss something else, is interaction between radiation and, uh, and matter. And as you know, there is a classical theory which was published exactly 100 years ago by Einstein. And it introduced two processes of emission, spontaneous emission. When you have excited atom, it produces a photon. And then induced emission. When you have excited atom, and it produces another photon. And uh, this emission is induced by a photon. And finally, you have two photons. Uh, <clears throat> absorption, of course, you have a photon. And then it's absorbed by uh, um, an atom in the ground state. And this atom becomes excited. If you calculate reaction rates, all these reaction rates, they're actually consistent with the classical Bose-Einstein distribution for photons. Photons are bosons, and they need to have this distribution. But as an engineer, I always had these doubts about, no, it, it, it's a correct theory, of course. It's, um, it predicted many things, including lasers. It was a great, a great, um, great vision of Einstein, who actually formulated this theory a long time ago. Uh, but from an engineering perspective, you see uh, this one reaction, that's another reaction. They, one is the reverse of another one, but there is no re reverse reaction for this one. It's very strange. It's very strange. And I always thought, why is the case? Why is this is the reaction is missing? It's correctly missing. It should not be here. If you put another reaction like this, it would not work, because then you wouldn't have this consistency with Bose and Stein statistics. Now, <clears throat> now, let us look what it means from these general rules that we just derived, that we always must use decohered components to determine the reaction rates, irrespectively if they decohered forward in time or backward in time. And we try to apply different rules and see if we can get results which are consistent with the great theory of great Einstein. And <clears throat> first, of course, we would assume that, say, photons always decay here. And then it would produce correct, correct equation for absorption and incorrect equation for emission. Another assumption would be, OK, so it didn't work. Let us try uh, recohering photons. Maybe photons should behave like antimatter. And in this case, again, the reaction rates are wrong. The reaction rates are correct for emission, but incorrect for absorption. And finally, we choose something which matches Einstein's theory of radiation. We assume that decoherence neutral radiation interacts with matter. What it means? It means that on emission, when emission occurs, uh, radiation recoheres. And when absorption occurs, radiation decoheres. Decoherence here and decoherence there. This produces exactly the same results as, as Einstein's theory. So it gives another interpretation why it should be written in this form. It doesn't introduce any new theory, of course. It just gives an explanation. It shows consistency between what we considered from general principles of uh, decoherence and general principles of thermodynamics with existing knowledge about interaction of uh, matter and radiation. Also, this recoherence is not just imagination. It's not just a mathematical trick. Recoherence is possible and is observed in lasers. 
when photons form a coherent beam and they cohere into unique structure. It's a physically observed phenomenon. All right, so what kind of conclusion we draw? From this perspective, there is no difference between spontaneous and induced emission. Both are the same. Spontaneous emission is nothing else but emission which is induced by photon which is emitted, but it's induced from the future into the past. Why from the future into the past? Because it recoheres. And we know that this recoherence process is possible because it's observed in experiments. So with this kind of topic, I probably should leave some time for discussion, but uh, the last slide I want to show is this. That's a summary, that's a conclusion. And fundamentally, we have two possibilities. We live in one of these worlds. It cannot be both of them. It's one or the other. It's either antimatter has opposite direction of time, opposite direction of time, as shown here, direction of thermodynamic time, of course. And radiation must be neutral then. That's one possibility. And another possibility is here, when antimatter and matter have the same thermodynamic directions of time, but radiation does not. It appears to be decoherence neutral. It must be there. So whatever mechanism, whatever mechanism enacts direction of time, it does not affect radiation in the same way as it affects matter and antimatter. Again, <clears throat> I'm not saying which one is correct. I'm saying just there are two principal fundamental possibilities. We live in one of these two worlds. And I believe sooner or later, and probably more likely sooner than later, we will know the answer. It would be one or the other. Okay, thank you very much.